that will make for good episodes. Yeah, I do. do we want me to record another goodbye? No, no, uh, no, no, no. No, I no, think no, that no. will be fun. No, 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 no. That's the price you're paying. Ah, oh, damn it. <laughs> I think that will be a, a fun one to, it will be, to do. Yeah. Hello, welcome to The Last Andy, a board game podcast coming to you from four different exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, bonjour. Alessio. In countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium, bonjour. Alessio. Hello. David. One one from Germany. And I'm your host, Ven. Uh, we're going to be talking about a range of different topics across the hobby, and today, as always, we'll start... What have you been up to? Uh, I'm doing very well. I've been uh, playing a few board games in the in the past couple of days, so um, I'll have a lot of things to, to discuss a little bit later, um, and uh, in the, the next coming few episodes. So, yeah, uh, doing pretty good. Uh, what about David? Yeah, real life isn't as easy at the moment, but otherwise, like we had like some fun. We played two fun games today with uh, Fan and you, which was pretty good. And then some time ago, we played Parks. So that's f for me on the board game front. <laughs> front. <laughs> yeah, th th there have been news uh, uh, across everything. So uh, myself. I I was uh, I was uh, rather busy this this couple of weeks because I had to research a bit <laughs> even the topic for today so it has a bit of study so it has been busy but busy but uh, funny the funny kind of busy and what about you fan no oh, you know I've been absolutely fine just been playing a lot of uh, uh, Zaya Legends with um, the people I board game with. We've had a few sessions of that. We had an unfortunate impromptu one because um, we had a route, the router reset and Fantasy Ground support forwarding broke, so we couldn't do role-playing last night. So we all zoomed around the place and played half a game of, uh, of Zaya, which was very enjoyable. A bit less uh, sandbox kind of game, but it is super cool. I'm, I've been playing that uh, for a while. That sounds like a fun game. Yeah, uh, I had it in wish list for a while, but I decided to pull the trigger because uh, I heard a couple other reviews. I think for a year or something now. Um, while we are on the, the topic of introduction, uh, Audrey cannot be here uh, this time, but they've been playing a lot of um, Tainted Grail recently. And I've been picking up, uh, picking my copy back up to uh, kind of play on the... on the same chap they are at the moment. So that might be a topic in one of the next few episodes uh, when they can join us again. Oh, I would love to actually, I backed the single web shipping for all in gameplay. This is the second time I did that. Uh, I did that first for Nemesis. I think I get, I get my stuff one year later than everyone else. So that's lesson learned. Never do localized one web shipping with Awakening Realms. <laughs> I mean, unless you want the, the, full tr the fully translated game. Of course, and there's people saying, oh, that expansion is not so good, it's not fine. Again. Of course, and there's people saying, oh, that expansion is not so good, it's not funny. So you, you get, uh, you get uh, the morality law b before you get the game. It's, it's fairly simple. You have to do what you do with a TV show. If you're going to watch a TV show and you're behind everyone else, you have to bury your do with a TV show. If you're going to watch a TV show and you're behind everyone else, you have to bury your head in the sand. You do the same thing. If, you, if you've chosen all-in-one shipping and you know it's coming later, you just ignore it. Like I've got um, Siege of the Citadel arriving soon and some people already had their part shipped. I've not looked at a single bit of which is why I've been patiently waiting. Um, it, I have no idea. It's going to be all completely fresh. You just, you know, bury your head. That's yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's actually good advice. But I, I, I always do kind of deposit because uh, I, I, I don't mind spoilers. 
in uh, and I get uh, negative uh, reviews be- before I can make up my own mind. That that is uh, terrible when it happens. Sand overhead, not listening. <laughs> Still works. Yeah. Okay. Um, before we move on to talking about our topics, we're going to have a little days ago. Um, while I was digging around, I came across a game that I immediately went, yes, this is this is what Kickstarter should be used for. This is it. And um, that's Cora Quest from Dan and Cora Hughes, who are a father and daughter pairing from the UK. Um, I th- I'm not sure exactly where the Kickstarter itself says Huddlesfield. I'm not sure if they are from there, but they're both reviewers who do um, a joint reviews for the Dice Tower. And during the time of lockdown, um, one of them got fed up with talking about Romans all the time. Um, spoilers, it was Dan. Um, and they decided to create uh, a little board game as a project, like a lockdown project. And as it started coming together, they went, hey, this is this is pretty good. So they kickstarted it. Uh, by the time this episode goes out, um, the Kickstarter is going to be over. Um, so this is pretty good. So they kickstarted it. Uh, by the time this episode goes out, um, the Kickstarter is going to be over. Um, so unfortunately, I didn't learn about this early enough to be like, go back this. But hopefully people have been ha- have seen this and, and given it a backing because it's £30. I didn't learn about this early enough to be like go back this but hopefully people have been have seen this and, and given it a backing because it's 30 pounds for a full job that's it and I think that it's it's new creators new designers um it's like a, a very young designer carry on following it she's definitely a very smart intelligent girl and very good at reviewing in my opinion um uh, so I just this this was like yes please I just slammed the support button on it because at thirty pounds it's a cooperative dungeon crawling game for ages six and up designed to be really something good so I you know wanted your thoughts as well oh it looks incredibly fun I don't know if you noticed but the username of the dad on Kickstarter is uh, Cabbage da- Dan which I thought was um kind of on topic for you fan <laughs> i had i had no idea anyway the, the standees are made by are all drawn by kids i think that it's not just cora it's a couple of uh, it's they, they got a couple of contributions all, uh, over the all over the world but the standees have their unique uh, a unique feeling and they are very cute. I appreciated the way in which the dungeon tiles, when they are drawn, they bring the enemies with them. That's a kind of smart. Yeah, when I saw the Kickstarter, I was like, hey, this game is uh, looking really interesting, especially if you had kids. It's like, if you had kids, it's like, uh, if you want to do a co-op, um, like, experience board game experiences would be perfect if you have any kids around you and i might pick it up not sure yet to be you've honest got, you've got three hours to decide at the point of recording not to date this too much exactly when we're recording but you've got three hours to decide at the point of recording not to date this too much exactly when we're recording but yeah, there's only three hours left to decide i think at 30 pounds it's just and for, for everything it's just if you even remotely like it you think about it it's it's a no-brainer in my opinion yeah that's the kind of games i love because i games i love because i can justify them to my wife it's for the kids mm. yeah i mean it, it looks it looks aimed at kids it looks immense fun very sort of enjoyable as i said i love that you can even make your own heroes and so the joy of turning to to, to a kid who's going to play and say all right turning to, to to a kid who's going to play and say all right create who you want to be draw your picture of what they look like we'll get a standy sorted boom get them in there yeah, I don't expect component and materials to be top notch, but uh, I think it's okay for the game. And actually, uh, I guess we will expand him. And actually, uh, I guess we will expand our cover photo with uh, standees from this game when we get that. Well, uh, from what I've seen, the at least the sample artwork for the tiles and everything, I think it's really quite nice. 
it's got a cartoony style, but uh, we'll have to see how thick the cardboard ends up being. Um, cartoony style, but uh, we'll have to see how thick the cardboard ends up being. Um, but ultimately, if you are playing with kids, you don't really want to be paying for super high quality um, stuff anyway, because you no know, kids are going to be kids. <laughs> I know. I have my Onitama set, which is completely destroyed. Mm. Completely destroyed. Mm. Yeah. So that was uh, the thing I saw, which I wish it could be my um, hot tip for back this now. Um, but instead, it's I just got to say in retrospect, in hindsight, um, you know, this is finished now. Hopefully you can late pledge at some point, keep it as something unique, fun. And best of all, like Townsfolk Tussle, it is pretty much one and done. You know how much you're paying apart from shipping. You know how what you're getting and you don't have to sit there and scratch your head over a bunch of add-ons that have suddenly appeared in the pledge manager afterwards at least i hope not you know which uh, again no by the time this recording gets out uh, it will be too late it's a dice game it's a dice draft game push your luck mechanic uh, like the acreps dice game and uh, it's cool because it's a project by a uh, lady which is uh, who is a professor at the Japanese University of Game Theory and Mathematics, I think. And uh, it's a project she made to demonstrate a new mechanic, and that's a Kickstarter the way you should uh, you should uh, make it, make them. That's a campaign to publish a game with manga graphics, so there is always audience for those. The game is interesting. It's uh, It has a nice and solid mathematical theory behind it. And uh, I I'm glad to know that by by now right now it is funded so it struggled a bit uh, and it that much famous but it uh, it is promising and looks fun and it's not a lot of expensive except probably the the import fees which will be a bit uh, a bit steep here but it's a nice game and it's interesting have a look at the Kickstarter page if you haven't. Uh, right. The import fees, which will be a bit uh, a bit steep here, but it's a nice game and it's interesting. Have a look at the Kickstarter page if you haven't. Right, that uh, sounds uh, sounds pretty interesting. I will take a look later. But uh, we got to move on from a steal of a Kickstarter game to a Kickstarter game about stealing. Look at the Kickstarter page if you haven't. Right. Uh, sounds uh, sounds pretty interesting. I will take a look later. But uh, we got to move on from a steal of a Kickstarter game to a Kickstarter game about stealing. It's time for us to discuss our first topic, and that is Burgle Bros, a wonderful player cooperative heist game from Tim Flowers, uh, the creators of Wart and Paperback. So, Burgle Bros is uh, literally it's it's a tile based heist game. Um, we're all. Everyone who plays is a unique member of a crew brought together in the Ocean's Eleven kind of uh, uh, thing. Um, they're looking to rob a secure build three floors, uh, two if you play in the demo. Uh, everyone's trying to hunt around, find the location of the safe, find where the next floor is, find the combination for the safe, crack the safe, get onto the next floor, and get out. The only thing that makes this really difficult is one, they don't know the layout of the building, so they're going in blind, they've got a what's located where, and there are guards patrolling. If you get caught by a guard, you lose a stealth token. You lose three stealth tokens, and you lose. That's any player loses three stealth tokens. So you, if somebody's down to their last stealth token, or they have none left, then you really need to think about protecting them. Um, it's got a whole bunch of others, each of the characters' unique abilities. There's tools that you can find along the way to give you one-off stuff. Um, the loot itself changes the game. You might pick up a key card on the first floor, means, meaning you have to be present to open the safe on the next floor. Or you might have an item that means you can't use tools anymore because it's really big and heavy. So involved in in-depth and there could be a lot of planning. And I like that. Simple but complex. Um, and the very different scenarios you can play add a lot to the game as well. So I brought this to everyone's attention and said, you've got to play this before we talk about it because I want to have a, a discussion about it. Uh, I really do because I think it's fantastic. I actually played it in a two-player games. I think the four, the first four tiles I moved to, every 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 tile triggered an alarm. 
Yeah, actually, actually, <laughs> you have to know what you have to know the game. You have to play it because it's cool. It works. There are waltz builds which are placed either randomly or or under a fixed design, depending on the scenario you are playing, and they are working as obstacles and making a fixed patch of routes, and uh, everything changes as long as you take your actions. Also, if you don't take at least two actions with your uh, with your character, you trigger an event which could be beneficial or detrimental. So uh, the game actually keeps you always on your toes. Yeah, you you have those four actions in a turn, and you might be thinking, well, why would I not use all four? What well, you look and you go, okay, I I can't do anything right now. If I move a little bit further, the guard's going to patrol this way, so I need to stop, which means I have to risk this event. They're mostly beneficial, but sometimes they're not. Um, it, it's, it keeps you going. It adds a lot to it. And the thing I find in particular that for you to keep moving is the guards, because um, the guard mechanic, I think, is, is quite beautiful. Um, it is the simplest form of the AI mechanic I've seen. It literally, when I pared it down and I went this is the the same AI mechanic that's used in um, in boss battling games in essence it's basically draw a target sp- uh, particular location and the guard moves over to there and, and essentially gets a free hit on anyone it passes through um, and I thought it was quite fascinating but the scary bit of it is first of all whenever a guard reaches a destination you don't know what and i thought it was quite fascinating but the scary bit of it is first of all whenever a guard reaches a destination you don't know what they're going to draw for their next destination um unless you have a the 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 rawhide headband master um the psychic who can spend a little bit of time checking uh and then um unless you have a the, the the rawhide headband master um the psychic who can spend a little bit of time checking uh, and then also when you ref- end the deck the guard speeds up and each guard on a higher and higher floor is one step faster from the beginning and it's it's it, you look at it, it's the difference between three and four movement that doesn't seem like much but when there's only 16 tiles on a floor suddenly it, it makes a huge difference and when they're up to like five or maybe even six movement they are just covering so much ground a turn it becomes a real challenge to avoid them especially when you've got more players when you play one player it's quite tently you're looking at it and you're going oh crikey i don't get to the guard gets to move three times for every time i move i have to think about where the guard will be and i have to think about everyone else on my team and how i can help distract the guard and suddenly deliberately triggering alarms becomes quite beneficial yeah concerning the alarm like when i played with the lexus square on purpose like as a, as a free action and that's a really interesting mechanic because like i can trigger an alarm on purpose and help my buddies out so they can do their stuff like break open the safe or uh, collect maybe like items or, or just like uh, explore the map meanwhile the guard has to go there but i have to get to safety as well so that's really fun mechanic i think yeah that was the the juicer is her name She's a. I I had her in one one player game, and I was like, this. She doesn't feel very useful here. Um, but with more players, I was like, yeah, she's really suddenly got some control over where the guard is going. Um, the the other characters all have some neat abilities. There was the Peterman who has bonuses to cracking the safe. Um, the Raven who she can deploy her bird to distract. And slow down the guards. There's the acrobat who gets a free move when he moves into the space where the guard is. Acrobat who gets a free move when he moves into the space where the guard is, uh, and he doesn't trigger stealth. It uh, doesn't lose a stealth as long as he moves out straight away, so he can like hop over the space the guard is in, which is fantastic. That's that's pretty cool. Uh, it is. Every character really adds a lot to the game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like uh... adds a lot to the game. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like uh, what I really like is like this, how those tiles interact with your movement. Like certain tiles force you to spend more actions, like the deadlock. Like you have to, if you want to move in, you have to spend three actions of your four, which is a lot. But but then like you you need to keep it open. So if another person moves in, he doesn't have to spend like those three actions. Or then you have like um, you have can actually peek 
and which means like you spend an action to flip a tile so you can see what's uh, what tile it is without moving on it but you can also decide to move on the tile the stuff that's on the tile will happen but if it can be something like uh, i don't know, remember the exact name but you can like fall down like one uh, one stage that's the walkway yeah if you move into the walkway without revealing it first then you just plummet straight off the railing and fall down yeah it's um it's um it's a really interesting game the um the only slight problem that i have is that every character seems to have um really different uh usability and some of the character um as you said uh in the one player game for example will not be able to do much um as you said uh in the one player game for example will not be able to do much while other character in the in the three or four player game uh will be way less potent like for example the the clairvoyant that can read the the guard's card when the guard is able to run the guard's card when the guard is able to run um five spaces on every one of it of their turn and there's three player um you know by the time you can only reveal it a tile and the, the god will be able to move 10 tiles before you mm. can move again so there's like um i i feel like being able to choose your character or or maybe between a couple of character maybe able to to change that although you said that there was some uh, advanced rule for each character every character has on the back an advanced version which does um, some different things uh, don't recommend using those to begin with because those abilities are harder to use um i don't have my copy sitting with me right now otherwise i could um, grab some of the abilities as an example yeah that's one example uh, i had the the, oh. the lady don't remember the name of the of the chart you can trigger an alarm in and uh, the expert version let you trigger the alarm in another way which was actually more complicated so i played with the basic version yeah yeah physically i do think we have to talk about this game as well like how it looks because um ah. it's quite pretty but i can tell you the physical version it comes in a small box what however small you think the box is it's smaller than that and it sits as a little tower like it's decorated as the the, the, the tower that you're going to be heisting and you open it up and there's a whole bunch of nice thick tile and you open it up and there's a whole bunch of nice thick tiles they're better than carcassonne tiles like really i don't know how many ply the cardboard is but it feels incredible um the cards themselves mine have already started bending a little bit um which i'm a little concerned about because a little bit um which i'm a little concerned about because it's not exactly damp here but when they're in the box they they tend to be held pretty pressured uh you get lovely wooden meeple pieces but they're shaped um to match stickers that you put on the characters so you get the full artwork and i love the artwork and the art style for this game it feels like a 1960s 1970s like heist kids program uh we don't call them meeple here uh we call them standee uh, I'll, I'll I'll forward you the last standing speech guidelines later. If they're made of wood, I'm calling them a meeple. <laughs> if they're made of cardboard, very high quality, um, and absolutely fantastic in my opinion. The game is a big experience. The one thing it doesn't do is, um, if you want to have it in the tower format with all three floors together, boom, 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 um, you need to get a third party insert cost. But, and this is it, Burger Bros 2 is taking pre-orders now, um, and it has multi-floors built within the actual design, which I think is super cool. The, the, it's a, based in a casino, they're adding a lot more events and, and abilities and very different things to it. Um, I missed the actual Kickstarter, but I jumped in on a pre-order because I was just like, yes, please. Um, this is really the episode where we're just recommending people to spend money. 
uh, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, we're always recommending people to spend money. We're not really spend money. We're not really looking at a board game and going, "I played this board game. I don't like it." That's, That's a good like, point. I, I mean, may, maybe at some point we might get to down the line where we want to talk about a game that we didn't like but has some interesting elements to it. But you know, this this one, best of all, I think, is you can jump in on a pre-order, and it's really close to shipping. Yeah, the little game that we played uh, a bit earlier together was mm. extremely fun. And I think that uh, I've rarely seen a board game handle a uh, quote-unquote stealth mechanic well. And this one really seemed to um, to scratch yeah. that itch. Like, it uses the mechanic in perfect way to make it uh, really interesting. It just doesn't have the, the gadget of a typical... Um, stealth adventure but it really has that um you know dodge the laser and like triggers the alarm and all of that it has a really cool flavor yeah absolutely dodge the laser and like triggers the alarm and all of that it has a really cool flavor yeah absolutely Hmm. I, that's one of the things I like about it. Uh, I like how the different alarms uh, force you to act in different ways. Some of them make you slow down. Some of them force you to stop or trigger the alarm. And you, but you have that decision. You're like, do I alarm? And you, but you have that decision. You're like, do I? I can just trigger this alarm and keep moving. Is another option. Um, so it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, we're going to wrap up shortly on this. But I just wanted to say, in Burgle Bros 2, there's some new stuff they added to expand on it. And I'm going to say, if you're going to get one of these, just get Burgle Bros 2, because they're looking to improve on everything, if, if you can wait. So they're adding gear, which is unique tools for each player that you can use during any player's turn. So that thing I was talking about where you're sat there waiting three turns and you're like, I can't do anything, I can't do anything. You'll have some stuff to help you and get more teamwork. Uh, in a bunch of new rooms. Um, they're adding some like one-time effects when you enter various rooms. They're putting doors in, locked doors, so you can crack the door or you can leave it to like block the path. So maybe the guard or bouncers, I think it is, can't remove this. Um, they're including uh, a mode to start hunting you. So the longer you take, they're just going to be like, we know you're here, we're coming for you, which I think is, I'll be interested to see how that works. And then a final finale. So you crack the safe and then you get a big twist ending. Um, they, they describe as the um, example, what will the team have to do to make it out with a grand piano slowing down or with a SWAT team on their tail? <laughs> so it's like the typical heist movie. Yep. And then finally, they're also including a campaign mode where every time you complete a finale, you open the next sealed scenario. It'll have new challenges and new tools to get the job done. So they've scaled up into a little bit of that legacy game, I guess. That's really good. Yeah. Uh, I had a question, but uh, do you know if Burgle Bro 2 will be compatible with the first one? I have no idea. Mechanically, they're very similar. Maybe the characters will carry forward. Um, or, or maybe it would be able to like redo the scenario from the first one with uh, the character from the second one, if you are. I'm not. I'm not. Something no. to check. Yeah, it is something to check. Um, I, I know some of the characters are reoccurring. Um, and they are uh, like, yeah, the, all of the characters are reoccurring, actually. Uh, we've got Rook, uh, Raven and Rigger. Yeah, everyone's there. Hawk, Juicer as Grandma. Fantastic. Um, yeah, if, if you're going to get just one of them, just get Burger Bros 2. Um, but you might not want to wait. Or you might want the more simple version. Uh, uh, apparently, there's not go there's no official variants, but the two games are very possible to uh, to combine. So you could be able to, you you could be able to um, use the scenario. For, so you could be able to, you you could be able to um, use the scenario from the first one in the second cool. one. But they say that uh, the second one is mostly uh, bigger and uh, newer than the first one. Ooh, 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 ooh. I was just taking a very quick look before finishing. Uh, the um, the burgle box. Ooh, 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 ooh. I was just taking a very quick look before finishing. Uh, the um, the burgle box, which is the box in which the game is coming with, is being done by Game Trays, which we talked about last time. Look at ooh. that. Yeah, go it, and have a look on the Kickstarter, people. Look at look at how good that is. It folds. It looks like a the casino when closed. It has trays inside for fitting all the things, and then it opens out completely and becomes the second floor that you play on. <laughs> what is this stuff? I'm getting it. <laughs> That's amazing. That's great. 
You can even get miniatures as well as an add-on, but... Uh, oh, uh, and you know how the miniatures are stored in a box that... Best of all, in a nice nod to the designer, it's fresh flowers, fast delivery. Because, of course, Tim Flowers is the designer. Nice. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> um, okay, well, I mean, you know, uh, there's lots of heist and everything, but uh, before we finish, I do want to say there is... Um, I love the final scenario that Eustace and David it briefly. It's the Fort Knox scenario. And it takes place on two floors and you play on a five by five grid, which increases the code size that you need for the safe. Uh, so you need to do even more work. And there's um, two uh, two safes on the second floor. It's really hard. Challenge. A lot of fun to try and do. But uh, we have to now go from Fort Knox to Fortified Orcs. And leading the charge of the discussion on Small World is David. After talking about... Uh... Great game in a small box. We're talking about a great game in a bigger box. Small World. So basically, Small World was um, is a place, uh, is a game where uh, you try to conquer a fantasy style world. It was made by Philip Cayet. I think in 2009 it was released. It's a rework of the Winchy board game. And um, yeah, Small World is, it's, it's a Winchy board game. And um, yeah, small world. It's it's a cool game which fits like right into ninety minutes. What happens basically? First of all, you have like um, fantasy fantasy um, map which you can conquer with different fan fantasy fantasy um, map which you can conquer with different fantasy races like uh, orcs, goblins, undead. And similar things, and then the twist is that you actually pick your your race in the beginning. However, they are combined for an ability that's Anna, and then you get like those small tiles which are based on the numbers written on both of the uh, race piece and then the the banner piece, and then you have to combine like you combine both abilities written on them, and then you try to conquer the world with them. I think plays like different versions i think there's like a personal we own small world underground i think uh, uh audrey mentioned the she owns the world of warcraft version i think what which version do you guys own uh my ex-roommate used to own the uh, the normal one in the world uh, and i remember having a lot of fun with the uh six player expansion if i remember correctly um what what is really interesting with that game is how uh, I mean, as the name implies, how tight the map is, and how every player within the next five within the first five minutes is um, forced to battle the the other players to expand. Uh, you you have basically no breathing room, and that's that's kind of the the fun of the game. Uh, which version did you had, uh, Teclas? I actually have the original Vinci, uh, the Vinci game, the the one which uh, small world. So it's basically the same mechanic, but it's not themed with fantasy races. It, they are just civilizations, and you get powers for your civilization instead of coupling power cards. But it works exactly the same, and it's cool because. Uh, you have a fixed number of battles is already predetermined because if you bring enough enough pieces, you can conquer the the territory. Or otherwise, you just can't conquer it, and uh, you go like that. You end up uh, uh, you end up using up your pieces until your empire is so vast that you cannot uh, possibly conquer anything anymore, and your stuff gets conquered. At that point, you just decide to send your old empire in ruins, start a new civilization, and start again conquering back. Your your old civilization get uh, keeps getting you points until it's completely from the maps. And I think this works exactly the same as Small World. That's the selling point of the game, actually. That's the fun part and the interaction part. Yeah, the fun, interesting part is like uh, some... Like the... There's different combinations between like your banner ability and the the race ability. Deck. Yeah, like you could have like diplomatic orcs or you could have like uh, aquatic <laughs> giants, and the combination is like really uh, really important. Like 
let's say you have like uh, ocean tiles and aquatic actually can conquer uh, like ocean or river tiles more way much way cheaper on the other side like uh, land tiles get more expensive like if i want to conquer a single um a single aquatic tile i would have to like place only a single tile of my own there if i want to uh, conquer uh, land tile i would have to pay like one additional tile so i have like three and three in total so it's way more it's way easier to s spread your empire on like river tiles yeah the the difference with uh each rule and each combination can really make uh or break the game i think like it, it's uh it's always funny to reveal the different combination i remember having like a really good time when the player just like check everything that's on the map and just start laughing at the name of some of them yeah i think this uh theme really cares to tune like it's it's like really fun to see like this different combinations uh personally what i like small balancing things like not all combinations get the same amount of tiles so like if you have a really powerful combination that means you can spread less or there are like some combinations where you keep getting benefits after your empire uh, has gone down and uh, at the same time like you have like empire is, is on decline and you pick a new new combination there's also the balancing factor that you get like points you have to pay additional points but uh, if somebody takes uh, one in the row which is like a lower one they can pick up those points and get them and additionally or balancing thing so. yeah it works uh, it works uh, real good actually because if you just uh, get what it's free you don't have to pay but you are probably stuck with a supper coupling but if you want the good stuff behind victory points for it it's uh, since that is the only variance in the game because the rest can be calculated it's actually a smart move to have that uh, the way it is so that game has already also expansions i think there is like an expansions with normal small world and underworld or under underground which means like you can play like sort of on two maps and there's also like personally we own um this like some event deck i don't remember the exact name which like enables you to um draw random events in every round however what one thing we found out is like there are some combinations of events and like banner abilities and uh, race abilities which can be like really difficult like there are some combination which like is flooding or i think it's called flooding which caused like people who took an combination which like is flooding or i think it's called flooding which caused like people who took an aquatic race uh, to have like really a lot of issues in that round because you're not allowed to um, take over any aquatic tiles so what's your experience with the expansions um i i don't have the so what's your experience with the expansions um i i don't have the the game myself but uh my ex-roommate used to used to have it and i remember uh us inventing friends and one of the expansion is um like a bigger map to play with um six to eight players i think and it's really really frantic the more people you load into that um that little world um i i always had a, a pretty good time and this is um as uh, Audrey called it uh, last time we, we talked, a great um, apéro game. Uh, what about you, um, Alessio? Uh, like I said, I played Vinci, and uh, that's actually a good game. I think that the theming that was done with uh, Small World actually made the game more interesting because uh, this game, uh, in my opinion, thrives on, ca on chaos. So... Uh, if you can make it frantic, like you said, or if you can make it funny to be in a mess, 
it's uh, it, it it's what we pays off and what what gets remembered when you play. So actually, uh, Vin- Vinci was possibly too serious. Uh, the the game is always fun because actually, actually uh, I I have a soft spot for games which in which the combat outcomes can ca- can be decided and uh, you can plan ahead uh, accordingly. But uh, I have to say that uh, in a game like this, when there is a lot of long-term uh, uh, decision space and not everything can be decided ahead. Uh, it is actually super cool to have funny races and funny powers and switching continuously. So uh, what uh, all I can say is, is that yes, Vinci is a good game, is a game, is a great game and it's the same mechanics but probably um, absolutely small world which Actually, I give to, to my brothers to for in two different occasions. I have two brothers. I gave them in the past uh, six years. I gifted them uh, each uh, small uh, small word at some point. I think that small word is uh, way funnier because uh, it thrives on the chaos. Yeah, right. Um, for myself, I used to own Small World before I left the UK. Um, it was one of the games that became a casualty as it just wasn't getting on the table enough. Good game. Um, definitely, I had it with the Necromancer Island expansion, which I'll tell you isn't very good. I, it's was meant to add a sixth player in, and it's not as interesting as actually just having a better board, um, which they released later. So up on Steam, um, it is available as a, I think even a phone app as well. But um, there's so many, so many of those uh, board game apps out now that it's uh, it's hard to find room for all of them. Yep. All right. Does anyone else have anything they want to say? Uh, no, it's a small game. Does anyone else have anything they want to say? Uh, no, it's a small game after all. <laughs> it's a small game. Yeah, yeah, it's a good one. It's very straightforward, yeah, which is good. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, uh, in our last topic, we move from the battlefield to the garden yard. Last topic, we move from the battlefield to the garden yard. And here with his best friend Einstein is Alessio, who's going to tell us all about deck construction and constructing of forts in Leader Games' card game, Fort. Yeah. Uh, this is a Grand Rodiac game. It is actually a reskin and a theme of uh, which was a Kickstarter game which uh, uh, I actually did a bit of research because I played Fort and was interested in it by reading the review from Space Beef. So kudos to him. It was actually uh, a fun review and uh, reading that I was interested in getting and playing the game. I actually other games, which has a very, very cool policy of giving away the official mods on uh, Tabletop Simulator. Uh, as a tabletop simulator model, which is official, and I had the uh, uh, way of playing plenty of games. So uh, this is a cool risk like it happened with the small world because SPQF was a bit civilization based and it looked a bit impersonal in playing, but Fort is full of personality, cool, joyous and everything. Uh, how it plays, it's basically a deck building game with a few twists. Uh, you have five kids basically and uh, a play area uh, what you do is uh, building your fort which is uh, your which is uh, one of your main ways of scoring points and uh, and you get five cards you your turn you happen to be the leader and there's uh, you play one card that card as a suit, as it happens to be, and gives you the chance of doing a public action and a private action, which is only for you. When you play the when you play the card and are the leader, you cut other cards of the same suit to boost your action, your public action, and uh, you can do what happens. Uh, you you can actually carry over at least one of the two actions uh, as long as you can. Uh, complete at least one of the two. 
After that, the other play option of doing the same public action you did without the chance of uh, uh, powering it up by playing a card of the same suit you just played. That's a really cool aspect of the game. The fact that uh, at every turn you still have something to do, you can still interact and join. Yeah. Um, I, I really enjoy that with Fold. The fact that uh, there's never... Uh, a down moment, basically. Even when you're not playing, you still keep an eye on, oh, what cards are being added to you, the yard, what cards are being played that I can join in on, and constantly yeah. trying to think it. <laughs> it. It is, it is. Yeah, it's pretty good. Um, it's it's worth noting that uh, it's a part of like the game's genetics because if you follow back and um, it's as you said, it's a re-implementation of Senator's popular Populesque Forest, which of course is a play on Senis Populesque Romanus or the Roman Senate and the people. This one means the the forest. Yeah, the yes, the forest Senate and the people. Um, and uh, it, they're both based. It's based on Rome. Uh, this mechanic of leading and following, first of all, turned up, as far as I remember, in Glory to Rome. You would do exactly this. You would play cards to follow, and you could play. Um, they were called clients in Glory to Rome. They're called lookout lookouts in this. And uh, that's part of what I like about it is it feels like Glory to Rome. It's got that same grabbing stuff other people want aspect, but it's implemented so differently. Actually, that is that is the other part. Uh, the following uh, the following uh, rule is uh, yes, is also implemented in Glory to Rome. It's an excellent example. It's a famous example, and uh, uh, that is a the first winning aspect. Actually, the second winning aspect is that the uh, uh, that is a the first winning aspect. Actually, the second winning aspect is that at the end of your turn. All the cards you didn't play are in your yards because they are kids. You left them, you didn't play with them, so they are in the yard and they are waiting to be picked. Uh, after yard and they are waiting to be picked. Uh, after that, you have to pick one card uh, yourself to add to your deck. You can uh, either check the cards in the other players' uh, yards, so that their discard you can you can get a card from their discard. Friends can't take their best friends. E every player has two cards with which are marked with a star, that, which they are the, their best friends, and they can't be stolen. They go to discard, and if you want to get uh, rid of them, Aurud, uh, you can do that uh, with game effects. But that's that. They stay with you. Uh, and if you don't want to pick a card from the from other players' yards, you can uh, just make new friends at the park. You pick one of the three cards which are always in the park, or you can draw a card, a, a, a face down card from the park deck it's in the park, or you can draw a card, a, a, a face down card from the park deck, and that's it. You pass to the next leader, uh, which will do the same. And uh, the game goes like that. Uh, now, some cards will give you the option to level up your fort. When you level up your uh, now, some cards will give you the option to level up your fort. When you level up your fort, what happens is that you uh, you get bonuses, which are in the forms of made-up rules, which are basically secret objectives. You get uh, objectives uh, you have to fulfill. They are the objective to score more victory points at the end, or perks, which are basically uh, uh, special abilities you get. They can be one use or they can be uh, always active. And uh, this is how the game flows. The, the super cool part is that actually you always get a hand have to, you have a, an immense decision space because of that, because you don't know what the other, you draw the cards and you will decide, you, you roughly plan what is your next turn. So you'll decide, oh, I'll play this card so I can get, uh, there are two kinds of, you can, you pay for stuff. But uh, what happens is that uh, you cannot carry out actions if you are prompted to get, for example, pizza and you are your pizza bar full. So what happens is that, uh, is that you have to plan ahead because 
you want to be able to carry out an action. You want to be able to, and boost it with as many cards of the same suite as you want, as, as you can. Because, of course, you don't want that your precious cards get on the yard to be picked by other players. Since you have to play basically one card and all cards of the same suite, that is the most relevant decision you have to do. Yeah. You have to do. Yeah. There, there's a lot of um, really cool um, interaction between the player thanks to that because on every turn you want to play as many cards as you can during other players' turn so that you can put uh, cards in your discard pile instead of your yards. And at the same time, you can put uh, cards in your discard pile instead of your yards. And at the same time... Um, when your turn comes, you want to make sure that the card that you put forward is not going to be too advantageous for other player. So when we played uh, Fan, David, and I, I was constantly looking for player. So when we played uh, Fan, David, and I, I was constantly looking at which card I would put down that wouldn't allow them to level up their forts. Uh, as I try to to like uh, make sure, okay, so nobody has enough pizza to level up. So if I put this level up, it basically wastes their I turn for them while I can uh, get a better fault. It's it's very interesting to try and, and think ahead and try to um, play against the other players' resources. And I think that kind of um, counterattacks what most uh, games like this tend to have the the sort of engine building type where you usually very much focus just on your uh, game mat in most of the game like in a race for the galaxy for example you will look at the opponents but most of the time you know you have enough interaction in your own side uh, right fan um i would say that race for the galaxy is more like a fencing match between two um two people in fact that was how i reviewed it a long time ago when you played two player race you're not so much directly interacting as you are putting small little blows from one side to other and trying to take advantage of what other actions your opponent's going to play and what it reminds me most of is the um, merchant situation in glory to rome so oh, yeah in glory to rome merchants take um resources and turn, stick them in your vault and they're worth points at the end of the game and there's also bonus points for having most of a single type and it's big points the vault is huge po vault is huge points so there's this massive game that revolves around everybody trying to avoid anyone else getting their hands on a merchant and then when somebody does tr they're trying to leverage it as much as possible for all those bonus points for example, if you're the only person who gets wood into the vault, you get four points. And in a game, the only person who gets wood into the vault, you get four points. And in a game where most buildings are worth three points, that's huge for one piece of wood. This was like constantly this. You're constantly looking and going, which of which public ability is least useful for everyone else and most beneficial for me? When's the best time to do this? But you also had that. But you also had that wonderful, terrifying moment of being like oh, if I don't play this card, somebody could steal it from me. I had one turn where Penny was like key to the strategy I was playing, which was putting stuff in my backpack and scoring for it. I wanted to upgrade my fort, but I looked and I went, if I play Penny now, then all that stuff in my backpack, no other kids will, will generate resources for me. So I ended up playing Penny and scoring my backpack stuff and not developing my fort. And I nearly lost to you because of that. Because you got the fort finished and got the bonus on the um, the sculpture. Oh yeah, I, I rushed towards that. <laughs> yeah, and I was a single point ahead of you. Which take about this is that three different pressures for ending the game, which is completing the fort, or somebody hitting twenty five victory points, or the deck running out. So there's even the game itself is saying, well, you know, you guys have got a limited number of turns. Even if you all start dallying around, I'm going to end this in about thirty turns or less with more players anyway. So I, I like that. And I think in some ways it's even, if it feels better than the ending of some of these other types of games, like um, Race for the Galaxy has tableau ending or victory points drained. And it always feels kind of like, oh, what, it's over? Whereas this feels like, oh, I can see it coming. You're on fort level four. I've got like 20 victory points. Oh, who's going to get there first? Everyone's going to get one more turn. Maybe, maybe not. I love it. I really, really love it. But I will say, before I before I shut up for a moment, 
I genuinely think that the retheming that Leader Games have done um, is a huge why this game is is as good as it is. Um, SPQF has a cutesy Robin Hoodie type Roman esque theme, um, but the change to be about kids building a fort in their back garden um, and being friends and stealing friends from each other is just oh, and, and Kyle Ferrin's artwork as always is amazing. Yeah, coming to, coming to that, like the artwork re really reminds me like we had like this water battles inside like close to my grandparents' uh, home on on some like kind of playground where we had like this different kids and like some sometimes from the cards reminded me of my like own experience back then, <laughs> so that's like really fun. <clears throat> Another thing I wanted to mention is like there are certain cards that allow you to remove uh, a kid from the yard from somebody else, like by being rude to them, like yeah, which can really mess up your deck building, which I haven't seen yet. So in, in that way, yeah, yeah, it's nice because it's interaction that um, if somebody does it to you, it's really your own fault because you've let that kid go to the yard. So you can't complain any kid that's in the yard if they get taken from you or they get trashed out of the game. Well, you know. The, the game is actually uh, as cool as it gets because uh, basically your decision space is very, very, very big, but you are limited in a, with a, you have a very limited action space. So what you do is uh, you plan ahead. In, with a, you have a very limited action space. So what you do is uh, you plan ahead, the other player gets uh, plays, for example, a public upgrade of the fort. You could follow suit and you would need that, but that will screw up completely your turn and uh, because you, you completely your turn and uh, because you, you won't be able to play that card in your suit and you will end up with two with two kids for example I, I love think i love think because it is always a free action which is uh, difficult uh, basically think lets you get uh, it gets it lets you get multiple pizza but as a private action it makes you exchange pizza for toys so basically you can get whatever you want but whoever follows only gets pizza so when everyone is full of pizza you basically play it for free and get whatever you need. A very cool low risk card, but it needs to be boosted a lot. It has a it has a lot of personality, and uh, you end up giving away think I, I I will never do that. So this game actually makes makes uh, as you make important decisions. Actually makes makes uh, as you make important decisions every turn and every other player's turn. There's no downtime because either you are acting or you are thinking about how to act. So everything is a active active game time. Yeah. Everything is a active active game time. Yeah. It is. I guess say as well, I, I do wanna just properly explore the three theming because I, I when you think about it each card is expressing this kid's personality and what they bring to you, um, personality and what they bring to you, um, what they what they like to do, and most importantly, this whole flow of the kids that you use are the kids that you're playing with, and they're the ones you maintain a relationship with. They're the ones that are keeping your deck and stay with you, uh, apart from your best friends who will stick around no matter what, unless you're a, t a terrible, horrible, rude kid and you trash them for some reason. Um, I think it's just a wonderful metaphor for kids and it feels just feels real, feels proper. Like, hey, everybody, we're going to build a yard. And then, you know, poor old ghost is sitting around in the corner like, well, why why aren't you playing with me? Uh, I'm going to go now. Bye. Yeah, the uh, game is good, but the, the theming is super cool. I mean, just made up rules for the secret objectives is super cool. Yeah. Well, speaking of the secret objectives and made up rules, the other bit I really like about it is at the start of the game, you deal a number of made up rules and per game, you deal a number of made up rules and perks equal to the number of players. And the first person to finish the first level of fort gets to jump in and choose one from those four. So not only do they get the best pick of four different options, 
but also they get to see what everyone else might be picking from as they made up rules. So there's a little extra reward for being the first for the best quality rule, the best suited um, to possibly what you're trying to do or highest chance of it. And you get to possibly see what everyone else might be trying to do and have a think about that, which gives this game a lot, a very high skill ceiling, which I, I like. And same with the perks. You get there first, you get the best choice of the perk. The only difference is every game is so dependent on this. Uh, actually, that is uh, the, the only downside I, I find. Actually, w when you play enough games, you will uh, uh, end up locked. You can exit locks, but for uh, since you draw cards at random and uh, you, are at, you are deciding uh, basically... The, in part, or uh, in part, based on uh, what you get, but uh, what you have in your hand could be a suit to play to follow another player. So the 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 game rarely goes exactly as you planned, and sometimes uh, just getting poor drafts or poor choices of cards and having to give up precious uh, kits and. It could happen that when you get to that made-up rule, you you get uh, rules which don't play with your current deck, and you won't know at least one. So uh, this is possibly the, the the only real defect of this game. I I wouldn't call it a defect. I think what it does is it puts impetus on you to get the first level of thought done as soon as possible, so you can see what directions the decks go in. And if you're not doing that, um, then, re um, then really that's on you. You've made the decision and you need to be more flexible in how you build your, your cards and pick. And if you look at the, the special power and you see that there's one that would work really well for your deck, uh, maybe it's worth uh, jumping on that or onto that one. Yeah, onto two, yeah. So it... uh, jumping on that or onto that one. Yeah, onto two, yeah. So it really does say, hey, you know, Get, get this done get get you are rewarded for early game rushing uh the thought levels at least the first two and even if you're thinking i'm going to do victory points you you it's encouraged to get some through but uh, i played with uh with players uh, <clears throat> my cousin will get frustrated by this so i i understand that this part could uh, put some people down so uh, actually if you like to plan a lot ahead and uh, you you may uh, to handle disruption uh, of your plans uh, poorly actually this game might not be for you that's true but uh, okay buyers beware yeah i i think essentially um to broaden that a bit more i'm just gonna say if you're the kind of person who likes to plan ahead and strategize highly around cards isn't isn't your thing and you should be looking at euros more for sure yeah uh, it, it's not a euro yeah a good thing to be said uh, about forte is that this game is so fun uh, and uh, when, when, when you keep thinking at the team uh, you you, you when, when you keep thinking at the team uh, you, you you look at the at the at the kid picture you look at what the actions are and you you it's like you always knew that that kid it's that kid from your backyard so uh that's fun because you from your backyard so uh that's fun because you could get frustrated but you have a look at the game at the board and you you can laugh oh the, the game absolutely nails the the whole thematic experience uh i i just love the use of toys and pizza as the current the suits of skateboards shovels um glue, glue yeah uh, uh squirt guns squirt guns <laughs> uh crowns coins of the wild card um is that there's six suits was that all of them oh books books yeah of course einstein and his books i love einstein um a, an ability, private ability, where based on the number of books you uh, play with his action, he trashes. Um, I think he trashes himself. Uh, he just feels really thematic uh, and on brand. Yeah, he's super nerdy and he reads a load of books and then um, gives you some victory points and he's gone. A load of books and then um, gives you some victory points and he's gone. 
yeah, really cool. Yep, agreed. Great, great game. Um, as I said, there's an official uh, tabletop simulator mod. Likewise, there's a really nice tabletop simulator mod for uh, Burgle Bros. Both, so you can play either. There's a really nice tabletop simulator mod for uh, Burgle Bros. Both, so you can play either one of those if you want to. Um, and Small World has an app on Steam and on iOS and, and on your phones and everything. So these are all kind of stuff you could be playing remotely. Uh, and I really would recommend them. If you play Fort and you enjoy it, you should certainly have a look at Glory to Rome, uh, which is more involved and more complex, but shares a lot of similarities in the mechanics. Um, once I explored into where Fort came from, it makes sense why there is that big... I was like, why is Glory to Rome mechanics sat in a game about kids building forts? In forts? Um, even down to the backpack being like the vault. You know, I was like, ah, now it makes sense. You can see its pedigree. Many card games go back to glory to Rome, unfortunately, or fortunately. We're very lucky in that way. This made me remember, actually, that the, there is a potential, that it, it, there is a thing which is actually uh, an upside and a, and a downside at the same time. There is uh, actually no fixed use for stuff like the lookout or the backpack. Uh, if you get that very specific made-up rule, you could end up scoring a lot of victory points with the lockout or the backpack, but on the stuff like the lookout is just powering up a suit and it could actually hinder your plans in the long term because your deck is changing so much. So uh, this is a, an upside because uh, you can always come back from a bad game, but but in, at the same time it, it is a it doesn't let you plan a lot around that because you know that. It has not a fixed role in the game. But that's the game as a whole. It's not so much about having a plan as it is reacting to a constantly changing, shifting environment. Yeah, it's it's always, every turn you're looking and things are different. And because you're gaining one kid, you, you're, you could be in a whole new world from where you were last turn, which is fantastic. Play fort and don't be that kid. <laughs> And uh, from faults to uh, dark dungeons, uh, I'm going to talk very quickly about a super fun game, a friend of mine, called uh, Escape the Dark Castle. It's a really small game that reminds me a lot of the old um, Choose Your Own Adventure book. Uh, it has a, a black and white art style. It's a game that comes in a, in a box with a um, very big uh, tarot-sized card that you go through as you explore a castle. You play as a, a prisoner of that castle, you have your own little character sheet and each character has a, a special die that will represent this ability. So for example, if a character has a lot of strength, the die will have a lot of um, uh, fists, for example, to represent its, its strength. But if they have more wisdom, the die will have more uh, wisdom faces. Um, and as you go through the, the castle, you'll uh, flip over uh, cards that will represent uh, encounters. So it can be just having to sneak be, uh, behind a guard, having to fight uh, some um, zombies in the sewers, or maybe uh, trying to avoid a trap or something like that. And every time you'll have to roll uh, a specific amount of die and um, through the game, you'll get some uh, items uh, that allows you to, to get better. Um, um, it's a very fun game that reminded me a lot of uh, Monkbook, the RPG that we talked a few episodes before. Uh, it has a few expansion, and each expansion uh, comes with a new um, uh, end boss and sometimes new rules. I know, for example, that one of the expansion uh, makes you face a dangerous cult. Uh, and that can curses you. Um, and overall, I think it's an extremely fun small game to play with like RPG fun. Like if you don't have the time to play a full on uh, dungeon crawl, you can have that full, that same feeling with against uh, around half an hour. And that has a lot of uh, replayability. Um, the, the fun mostly comes when you play with more than one player, as you can uh, decide who's going to uh, go through the next door, who's going to fight uh, which monster in, in what order, because each player will have different um, some set of abilities, so you can kind of um, uh, help each other that way. 
uh, it's it's a lot of fun. Uh, I would recommend it to anybody that is interested in choose your own adventure games. Uh, yeah. Even though you you don't choose, you just turn over cards. But <laughs> yeah, I was just quickly skimming through and uh, taking a look at it. it. It reminds me aesthetically of like a 1980s, early 1990s style. Yeah, it, it definitely has that. And also a little bit of um, oh, that that game. I, I have trouble. It's a really long name. It's the game where you play dueling wizards with crazy spells that you stick together. Aesthetics. Of that game. Uh, I, if you've not ever seen that game, it is worth watching um, Will Wheaton and everyone play it. Um, it is, it's a very silly game, but do you see, if I've just put, popped an image up for him, you can see the, that kind of crazy aesthetic of very yeah. wild nonsense, although more cartoony and skull, fire, and skull fires. But yeah, it's um, Epic Spell uh, spell Wars of the Battle Wizards Duel at Mount Skullfire is a game I... I actually kept <laughs> because of because of how crazy 1980s it was. So Dark Castle definitely. I'm looking at this like, ooh, well, this is looks kind of cool. Oddly, um, even though it even though it's cooperative, it reminds me of um, of Drakenborg um, or Dungeon Quest, as some people know it. In that, move through a dungeon and random stuff happens to you randomly, and you don't have a lot of control over your decisions, but yeah. you have some. Uh, you you don't have a lot of control and it's more about but yeah you have some. Uh, you you don't have a lot of control and it's more about the the adventures that you'll go through. Um, the game kind of embraces the the whole uh, losing side. The Dark Castle even comes well. You you can buy additionally a book uh, called the Death Book, which has a different well. You you can buy additionally. A book uh, called the Death Book, which has a different, uh, a very gruesome description of every death that you can encounter. So, for every enemy, for every card that can do damage to you, if you get killed by that one, you have like a little reference that you can look into the Death Book and read wait, wait, how. Wait. Reference that you can look into the Death Book and read wait, wait, how. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. Let, let get this straight. You buy an expansion to tell you how you die. Yeah. <laughs> you, you buy an expansion that is uh, like a, a few uh, hundred pages of uh, very some and descriptive uh, explanation of how your character got gutted. It's very fun. You know what else this re- you know what else this reminds me of as you described, um, and I actually talked about this on the Discord earlier this week. The absolutely terrible Games Workshop game Chainsaw Warrior. Which is yeah. probably how not to do it. This sounds like the right way. Quick mini review. Chainsaw Warrior sucks. <laughs> that's that, that's the review. I, I bought it on Steam uh, on sale for uh, less than a euro and seriously considered asking for a refund because it is literally draw a card random stuff happens oh it's a it's a crud and um, literally my first run through I got partway through and the game went hey have you got an escape rope? Rope? No, then go back to the very beginning and you have to do everything again, but you don't have enough time to do it. And I was like, really? Okay, I knew this would be random and a bit crappy, but I didn't realize it would be that terrible. So I wanted the experience. It, it, it is indeed not worth it. <laughs> so yeah, I would uh, I would definitely recommend uh, Escape the Dark uh, Castle, definitely, as a, as a small, uh, fun party game, well, party game, like a evening game for some friends, small, uh, fun party game, well, party game, like a evening game for some friends. Uh, and I think that Escape the Dark Sector uh, looks even better. Uh, and uh, I might actually play that with some friends because, um, yeah, it, it just has an extremely cool look and aesthetic to it. So I'll play that with some friends because, um, yeah, it, it just has an extremely cool look and aesthetic to itself i love how um, all of the characters in both of the games they're so humdrum looking and they, they all look yeah. like they don't want to be there or, or in the case of escape the dark sector they've got super boring like it has real uh wrecks that don't want to be there and i kind of stuck in the this situation <laughs> it's very fun yeah and that's all we have time for this episode. You can catch us over at www.patreon.com, The Last Standy, or as The Last Standy on Twitter. So until next time, we have been The Last uh, From Belgium, au revoir. Alessio? It's me, hello, bye. 
Uh, David? Um, is he dropped off? Mm. No. Oh. Mm. No. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I simply forgot to, to press down my push to talk button. <laughs> I was here, I, like, I, saying I, something, and then... <laughs> that 100% is going to be the cold open, David. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's going to be the close. I'm not doing this again. That's it. And second E in last standee stands for expertise.